Good morning. I'm David Grease, Professor Emeritus of Computer Science at Cornell University, although I'm still teaching. I'm here to interview the other professor of computer science at Cornell, my friend and colleague since 1969 when I came to Cornell, Eurus Hartmanis. Eurus received the ACM Turing Award in 1993. Let me read the citation to you. With Richard E. Stearns, in recognition of their seminal paper which established the foundations for the field of computational complexity theory. In their paper on the computational complexity of algorithms, they provided a precise definition of the complexity measure defined by computation time on Turing machines and developed a theory of complexity classes. The paper sparked the imagination of many computer scientists and led to the establishment of complexity theory as a fundamental part of the discipline. And that's why we often call Eurus the father of computational complexity. Eurus wears another hat. In 1965, he became the first chair of the newly formed computer science department here at Cornell. He's largely responsible for its development. It is due to his vision and leadership that it became one of the top five CS departments in the U.S. Eurus is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Latvian Academy of Science, and more. He has two honorary doctorates. Two other of his awards, the Balzano Gold Medal from the Academy of Sciences in the Czech Republic, and the CRA Distinguished Service Award, CRA being the Computing Research Association. Eurus also served as the Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation, the NSF, where he led SIES, the Directorate of Computer and Information Science and Engineering. One last point, Eurus was born in Latvia on 5 July 1928. So in about one and a half months, he will turn 90 years old. So Eurus, would you like to tell us a bit about your childhood and perhaps talk a little bit about your father who played such an important role in your life? Yes. Well, as David said, I was born in Riga, Latvia, uh, one of the three Baltic countries which line the uh, western shore of, sorry, eastern shore of uh, the Baltic Sea. It, that is a very lovely area. The Bay of Riga in particular is a beautiful beach area and a vacation spot for many of Europeans. And yes, my father was a very, very important person to me and to the whole family for what positions he had held and what happened in that area politically and otherwise. My father was born in the western part of Latvia. And his family uh, were landowners, and there were three brothers, three sons. Clearly, the older son was going to inherit the land and take over the farming business. And so my father had to seek another career and after finishing elementary and higher education, he 
graduated from a technical railroad school. And he showed in general interest in technical things all through his life. And encouraged me to build things and particularly emphasizing learning. And so he chose the military career. Since at that time, the Baltic states were under Russian influence, the only way, uh, the only military he could join was the Russian army. So he joined and served in a Russian infantry division. And during the time he was sent to <coughs> military school in Lithuania. And after graduating as a lieutenant, basically, uh, he was assigned as a staff officer in a Russian infantry division. That was unfortunately the time right before World War I. When World War I started, he was <coughs> in the first or second Russian army, both of which inva invaded East Prussia. The German response was quick. Their use of their railroads to sh move around their units, their armies, uh, led to a quick defeat of the first and second Russian army. Uh, those armies basically disintegrated, and a large number of Russian uh, soldiers were taken prisoner, including my father. It was fortunate that for him that in World War I, uh, prisoners of officers who were prisoners of war were well, reasonably well treated. They did not work and they were reasonably nicely housed. So my father spent the three plus years in <coughs> as a prisoner of war uh, in reading, perfecting his languages, learning from <coughs> other <coughs> excuse me <coughs> other officers, other prisoners. <coughs> And the war ended. Uh, he immediately returned to Latvia, and by then, Latvia had de declared their independence, their sovereignty in 1918. And my father joined the army which was being constructed at that time. He was a staff officer and <coughs> at the same time as uh, at the time he was also sent to Poland as a military attaché. Mm -hmm. And 
after a while serving in Latvia, uh, he was ordered to the French Military Academy. Uh, and he spent two years there finishing the class, which was very interesting that Ch Charles de Gaulle was his classmate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lovely picture where the first row of officers are sitting in the front row in various different uniforms, not French. And the French officers are behind them standing. And right in the middle, the first standing officer is the goal. So very nice. clearly identifiable. And so this was highly selected group of officers mostly probably some majors but mostly mm -hmm. lieutenant colonels colonels and uh, actually uh, for my father it was a very lovely experience uh, really learning military diplomacy besides uh, fighting and unit commands. And my mother, whom he had married shortly before, spent the two years with him in Paris. After returning to Latvia, uh, he continued his career and very soon uh, was deputy chief of staff of the Latvian army. And shortly after I was born, 1928, uh, he was uh, promoted the chief of staff of the Latvian army. And so, not only that, for his service to the liberation of Latvia, he was awarded a country estate, Lestene, uh, in a beautiful park-like setting a uh, charming two-story house. I was told it had 38 rooms, but I never checked on that. Uh, but it was very nicely situated. There were still some original uh, stone walls which originally sur surrounded the whole complex. And uh, it had a had land with it which was being farmed which really helped us uh, during the war times and so our as as uh, children our summers with the family were spent in less than on the country estate <coughs> and winters going to school in Riga. So it was really a happy and enjoyable life with lots of security. I mean, uh, I was proud of my father, mm -hmm. who I saw mostly in uniform during days, during weekdays. <coughs> and his chauffeur 
had a very strong influence in me first. I bombarded him with all kinds of technical questions about cars. <laughs> and uh, the cars were nice. That was a Nash sedan, <coughs> built the same year I was born. <laughs> and the one which I enjoyed most was a big Mercedes sedan. Uh, and so the chauffeur really was almost a companion because he stayed with us and uh, we washed the car and uh, he explained to me that he is a tank commander in the army and the moment uh, <coughs> the Western army would be involved in some conflict, he would join the tank unit as a tank commander. And so I was very impressed also that he was a very good soccer player <laughs> and helped reinforce the local soccer team. <laughs> well, unfortunately, this all changed when I was 12 years old in 1960. 1940. <laughs> 1940. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what have happened is what happened is that Hitler had decided that he will attack Poland. He did not want to risk a war with Russia. So the foreign ministers Ribbentrop and Molotov uh, signed an agreement, a peace agreement, I mean non-aggression agreement, uh, with a clause that Russia would get the eastern part of Poland and Hitler would attack and keep the western part. And there was a, apparently a secret protocol which said basically that Russia has a free hand, and I should say really the Soviet Union, has a free hand in the Baltic states. Well, the result was that the Russians immediately requested rights of naval and uh, air bases in those countries. Same was done to Finland. Finland went to war with Russia. And that's an interesting piece of history. What happened? Resistance of the three Baltic states was just totally impossible. And almost ironically and sadly, uh, my father was deputized to be the liaison officer to the Russian units uh, the ear and uh, naval Russian units and the one thing I remember that my father apparently was working very very hard to keep out the Russian families 
of the officers serving there uh, being uh, housed in Latvia. It, to him, it clearly that looked just one more step. And, and the next step came, the Russians occupied the Baltic countries, certainly Latvia, uh, shortly after that. That meant that the school which I attended was a French lycée. There were heavy doses of French classes, but a very interesting mix of students. And so out went uh, the French, in came Russian, and for a year I had to listen to lectures on the glory of the Soviet Union how rich it was in minerals, and how great the Soviet army was. Uh, and on Christmas 1940, uh, my father was arrested. And uh, the only thing we knew was that he was sent to Moscow. And I think that clearly was emotionally and otherwise a real shock. But since we didn't know what happened to my father, I certainly was convinced that He's probably serving somewhere as a general, and uh, that we'll meet after the war. So it was several decades later when the Soviet Union collapsed that we found out what happened to him. He was uh, taken to Moscow. Uh, there was a trial, and he was convicted and executed in short order. But we learned of that only after the Soviet Union collapsed. And for a short while, the KGB and other files became available uh, for historians and politicians to inspect. Then we learn about the, t the date and the place where the trial took place. And you know, I don't know what he really was charged with, but it didn't matter at that time. But when you were 11 and he was taken off, you just thought that he would come back after the war. Oh, yeah. So very, very definitely. Uh, well. Uh, and what happened with Lestina at that oh, time? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. The, when the Russians occupied Latvia, Less than it was taken away from us, was nationalized or confiscated, yes. whatever words were used. And otherwise, we were not touched. Uh, my mother and my daughter, sorry, my sister, who is two years older than I am, uh, we are on a list to be deported to Siberia, and I was very peeved that I was left off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't matter. Yes. Yes. Anyway, 
uh, it was a horrible year for Latvians. Large number of people were, were sent to Siberia. Uh, large number were arrested and disappeared, never returned. And that ended when uh, Hitler attacked Poland. And uh, that was followed by very, very quick defeat of the Russian units in Latvia and was occupied. And uh, we spent four years under German occupation. Uh, in school, Russian went out. German came in as a foreign language. And less than it was being returned to us. So during the tough time, the four years, when people all had to live on the rationed cars and so on, we had a nice side supply of food and, and income, I guess. Uh, I'm sure that we had to deliver uh, certain quotas like all farms did. But you didn't have all of less than a... Sorry? The Germans you? lived in less than a two? No, no. Oh, not then? No, less than okay, it was good, ours. Good, good. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother then clearly had was the head of the family and uh, spent a fair amount of time uh, in Lestena. That was under the German mm -hmm. occupation. Uh, we noticed that certain students did not return to the, what was used to be French Lycée, which was some public school 49, I think. Mm. I'm probably wrong on the number, but on the Russians, and then uh, again, German language came in. By then we already uh, all spoke German quite well. Uh, that's about the highest level of French I had achieved when it was eliminated as a yeah. foreign language. Um, the, and we noticed and uh, that the students who did not return, after some reflection, we concluded were Jewish students. Mm -hmm. And so, though the German occupation was hard, and, you know, we know what they did with uh, Jewish people. Yeah. But otherwise, the occupation was harsh, but it didn't seem that unnecessary brutality was used to, to control it. It is a fact and a sad fact that uh, Germans did recruit people or draft people 
from occupied countries. And so two SS divisions were formed and Latvians just drafted. In a very interesting um, way, number of people from who worked for us as on the farm uh, were drafted. But we got a U Ukrainian, Russian soldier, which was a prisoner of war, apparently well vetted to come and work on our farm, less than, uh, you know. So Germans were manipulating manpower And, uh, you know, sadly, the people who were drafted in the SS had a very hard time explaining and being understood for possibility of leaving Germany for the United States and so on. And, uh, you know, a lot of them died now less than a, near less than a, is a very nice cemetery of the Latvian soldiers who were killed in that area during the last part of the war. They were very, very fierce fights around Christmas time, 44. Uh, less than I survived and uh, you know when when World War two ended, so we were not in Latvia <coughs> uh, it was returned to us again. Mm -hmm. So, less than I came and went, and uh, gave me a, a lovely childhood, and uh, sad things mm -hmm. happening also. So, the Germans, when they came, did they occupy Lesnar at all no. towards the end? Uh, no. <coughs> but, but. No. Th they didn't occupy it until late or basically 1944, somewhere. 44, yeah. When the front approached, mm. <coughs> they requisitioned Lesnar for a general, mm. for a German division staff. And so it was taken over as is. We were given some end rooms which could easily be separated from the rest. And so there was a division staff with officers, German officers, lots mm. of them. And uh, uh, we were there, we were from the, the general there and the, the officers respectfully treated as a general's family. And then 44, late 44, middle 44, uh, the German war was really going badly in the east. And um, in October, 
that year than we in less than a could hear artillery duels. Uh, the commanding general encouraged my mother and our family to leave and uh, promise land and sea transportation to Danzig, uh, which we accepted, which my mother accepted, and uh, we went to Danzig. So we you got there by ship, right? Uh, sorry. To Danzig. Sorry. Yeah. We went to Winspils, yeah, which that's, is a that's for the Latvian harbor. And you know, the nearness to Germany, the Baltic countries lined up there, were really ideal air bases for German army, German air force. And similarly, the two Latvian harbors on the Baltic Sea could be kept open in winter. And so that was also something which the Russians wanted. And, uh, you know, first air bases, later yes. occupation. And uh, we accepted the offer, got to Danzig. So you, you missed your first ship, I think, right? Well, you want to talk about that? We, we missed our first ship. Uh, the driver was a German driver with bad Latvian maps. Mm. And no GPS at that time. No, <laughs> no, no. And uh, so we got to Ventspils too late to get on the ship, ship left. But there was another ship leaving in a few days, uh, there is some evidence, but not really confirmed. But I don't know any confirmation of it, that that ship was torpedoed because the Baltic Sea crawled with Russian submarines. Uh, that other ship, it's a day's trip from Ventspils to Danzig. And uh, we got there. We were asked where we want to go. And we said Marburg, which is a small university city in the west of uh, Germany. It's, it's north of Frankfurt. North yeah. of Frankfurt, yeah. Frankfurt is a major. Yeah. Köln mm -hmm. is also close. Yeah. Uh, we got to Germany. Uh, the whole family, my sister, by then she had a husband and we both, my sister and myself, in different displaced person camps, finished high school, Latvian high school in Germany, in Latvian, everything Latvian. The good thing in that was that we got superb teachers. Teachers were respected in Latvia and well-trained. But these were people with academic, real academic, who were even professors at the university, who had fled Latvia as the Russians advanced, and were delighted to have something to do in the displaced person camps. So, First, I was in a displaced person camp in the British occupying zone. 
in Blomberg. Very nice little city, but crossing the occupation zones was not terribly easy. Anyway, so after two years in Bloomberg High School, I transferred to Hanau Displaced Person Camp to go to the high school there, which was much closer where my mother was in Marburg. And I graduated uh, and returned to Marburg, went to the university, enrolled, they accepted me as a student in physics. So there I was in physics at University of Marburg, spent two and a half years, two real years, the last one was when we were ready to leave for the States. And uh, I went and took my four diploma, the exam mm -hmm. before the, you get the diploma graduating. Uh, did well and uh, After that stay, when uh, we finally were allowed to come to the States, so you had to have a sponsor. Mm -hmm. We had a sponsor, a friend from Latvia, who was an architect and worked in Kansas mm -hmm. City. So how did your mother make a living? Ah, yes. Anyway. So we went to Kansas City and the sponsors uh, really helped there and question how did we survive financially? Well, when the Russians arrested my father, well, Actually, the Latvian police did the mm. arresting. Mm. Uh, they, fa they, they took lots of things. They took all my father's uh, medals, big box of all kinds of local, uh, sorry, Latvian and foreign countries mm. uh, medals. Uh, but they f failed to move a painting and discover that there was a little safe behind it. So, you know, not very mm -hmm. professional. And, and there were British pounds there. <laughs> uh, clearly, Foreign country, uh, sorry, foreign currency is very legal under occupation. You couldn't own them. You had to surrender them. Well, my mother took the English pounds and they were exchanged when we got to the States. And we were surprised how strong the <laughs> pound was in those days. Uh, well, my mother, when my father was arrested, decided that she must have uh, some skill. And she enrolled in a school to, uh, in dressmaking, or sorry, mm -hmm. Yeah, basically uh, seamstress dressmaking, okay. and uh, when she got uh, to uh, Marburg, 
and uh, the Allies, the, the Americans occupied that part. Uh, she started basically copying the recent fashions from uh, American uh, magazines. And uh, very quickly, just by word of mouth or seeing them, uh, she developed, while we were in Germany, reasonable business in the kitchen uh, in the house where we had we had a small part of a apartment. And when we came to the States, uh, she got a job as a cook <laughs> in a rich family. But, you know, how it all worked financially. I know, I know that her sister, who was also left, left Latvia and was in Germany, sent some money <laughs> to help. But uh, really, she uh, was her labor, and it was mostly the sewing, which allowed me to uh, study at Caltech. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's really quite an achievement on her part. Yeah. She guided us well and, and uh, supplied us. So you ended up coming to New Orleans and taking the train to Kansas City? No, no, no. Uh, I was supposed to ah. come from, uh, from Hamburg. Uh, to New Orleans and mm -hmm. then by train to Kansas City mm -hmm. where our sponsor was. Uh, a, big st a big cold storm hit and uh, the B deck on the ship cracked, had a crack. and. We and my ship buddy had no idea how dangerous this was. But we discovered that there was a small group of sailors and some officers who were observing the crack as it slowly moved forward as the ship was rolling in the waves. And uh, what they tried to do is they tried to trap mm -hmm. the thing. And so they would make, a, the officer would make a cross. I mean, they were sweeping the snow away, make a cross. And the sailors with a big, sailor with a big drill, drill and couple, held blocks to keep it in place until it really dug a hole. And uh, <coughs> the first one missed, the second one missed, they drilled the hole and the crack bypassed right. it. And then on the third one, finally it went in and to a great sigh, the the, the gap, the hole, sorry, the, the crack, kept us letting bigger and smaller. But the drilled hole trapped it and didn't continue. Uh, and so 
the ship was damaged. They had asked other ships to stand by <coughs> because, you know, it was touch and go. Uh, and they routed it to London, uh, <laughs> to New York, which was the closest mm -hmm. big harbor there. And there stood an identical ship to ours. We moored it next to it, I think, very close. And we're told just to go to your cabins, go to your rooms, go to your beds. And we just slowly transferred everybody exactly to the same situation where we were on the other ship. Mm. And then we took off for New Orleans. I don't think there is an official register anywhere in my papers or my, mm. uh, which says uh, first entry, New York. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's first entry, New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And then we were in Kansas City. Yeah, you had a couple of jobs before college? Yes. Uh, I was building combines, <laughs> and uh, then either bad weather or whatever, uh, predicted smaller sale of the combines than expected, <laughs> and I was let go. But by then I had a American godfather mm. who, you know, a nice man, nice family, friends of our sponsors, mm -hmm. who got me another job uh, at Sheffield Steel. So I was a steel worker, joined the union, was more or less told to join the, the <laughs> union. It was strong then. And uh, in meanwhile, the university counted in my Studienbuch. So you applied for the undergraduate school. Well, I yeah. applied to the university, to university and gave my papers, all lists of the courses I attended, which are all recorded mm -hmm. in the student yeah. book, the study book. Uh, and they said, you have so and so many credit hours, you must have a bachelor's degree. So you will be a graduate student. <laughs> I thought, that's fine. Uh, roughly two years in a German university, <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree. Uh, unfortunately, I wanted to study physics no graduate program in physics, uh, but there was a, they said, a good math department, and uh, so you will be happy studying mathematics. <laughs> I was. Kansas City was nice. Uh, That's how Ma majors are chosen. <laughs> no, I didn't. We think, uh, yes, we think we're choosing things, but life chooses oh, it for no, us. Oh, no, 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 no. I knew that in my life, many decisions I didn't make. Uh, 
Anyway, so I became a graduate student in mathematics. For the first time in I, my life, had a straight A <laughs> record, never before. Uh, and my mother by then spends a year as a cook for a lady who was married to a very fashionable and, and good doctor who was also associated with a University of uh, Kansas, mm -hmm. Dr. Heschinger, uh, very kind, probably wrote me a great recommendation for Caltech. So, Eurus, you finished your master's degree in mathematics at Kansas City. What happened then? Oh. Well, what happened? I, <laughs> I wanted to continue my education. You know, that was instilled in me that I was going to get... Your father did a good job. Yes, indeed. Uh, so. Well, so since I was going to continue my education, I had to have a university. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got all kinds of advice, but well, I applied to three, uni three or four universities. Uh, I applied to uh, University of Nebraska, University of Kansas and Caltech. Mm -hmm. Well, why University of Nebraska? The answer is very simple. The president of Latvia had an agricultural degree <laughs> from Nebraska, I think a PhD, <laughs> but I don't know exactly yeah. what kind of degree. And since he was related by marriage, he was married to my mother's sister. <laughs> and he was the brother of the president of Latvia. So we had heard a lot about American graduate education and uh, about Nebraska. And I <laughs> thought, <laughs> if the president went there, must be a great university. Uh, I, was, I was admitted to all three schools, uh, but, but I applied, not saying exactly what I want to do. <laughs> I said, I want to get a PhD in mathematics or physics. Uh, well, my friends there said, don't be a fool, go to Caltech. Mm -hmm. uh, I applied to Kansas because Dr. Hashinger was, had been a dean of medical school there, I think. And uh, that, you know, it was a guaranteed getting in if he writes a recommendation. Well, Caltech assessed my physics knowledge well. Sorry. Truly, truly, that it wasn't great. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, you look like an applied mathematician. And never took course in applied <laughs> mathematics. 
so the physics, sorry, the mathematics department admitted me and uh, said that I will be uh, happy. It's a very good department, and it was. Mm -hmm. And so I went there as a graduate student. I bought my first car. And uh, my mother and I, we drove from Kansas City to Pasadena. Uh, arrived there, I met Ellie, who later was my wife, whom I married later. <coughs> Again, through kind of diaspora. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to Caltech, find it an amazing place. By then I knew a lot more about it. Uh, a small university, I think about a couple hundred undergraduates, uh, probably uh, more graduate students than that, and tremendous research activities. Yeah. What impressed me, that I knew that they had some Nobel yeah, the Nobel Prize winners, but they had so many mm. I didn't realize. Somebody called Anderson, Millikan, mm. uh, Feynman, uh, yeah. oh, and easy, several more. Yeah. Uh, and Linus Pauling, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's yeah. there are really a lot of them. And superb students, uh, the undergraduates. And, you know, it was it just a superb, school, and it was men only, <laughs> until the year I arrived. <laughs> that, <laughs> nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with me. Uh, but women were phased in slowly during the time. There might have been 10, 15 by the time I left. And uh, that was for me a wonderful experience. Pasadena is a nice place. Yes. There are mountains mm -hmm. next. Mount Wilson Observatory is there. You can just drive up. The ocean, yeah. Hollywood. The Rose Bowl? Rose Parade. Rose Parade, yes. Rose Parade, Rose Bowl. Yes. Uh, well, Rose Bowl I didn't you attend, didn't. <laughs> but I played volleyball mm -hmm. in the Rose Bowl Park. Uh, and, you know, so I had an exciting time as a student and just 
lots of other things to do and uh, you know if I would have been in physics I would have been slaving mm, that much harder hard to keep yes. up because uh, you know there they were the physics students they probably had some in high school and then in tense four years mm -hmm. at a great school. And then they came as graduate mm -hmm. students. They were a very, very select, selective group. So were the mathematicians. And, you know, I'm sure that Hashinger's recommendation and so on wasn't only on my academic standing, mm -hmm. all right, academic knowledge, uh, because I got in, in among a very small group of people, mm -hmm. and had just had a great time there. Ellie was there. We had joint friends. And you lived with your mother there? Mm, or no. Or did she go back to Kansas? No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. She came there and she was a cook for a Hickson family. Hickson? Yes, I think it was Hicks. Was was not Nixon. Not <laughs> uh, Anyway, so I had some very good colleagues there, and uh, life was just nice. Mm -hmm. And but then you had to write a thesis. Yes. Uh, and somehow I was, I guess, assigned to Dilworth. Uh, somehow mm -hmm. I knew mm -hmm. I was under his supervision. And he was doing lattice theory. And so he said, you need a topic. And uh, why don't you work on the lattice, the partition lattice embedding problem? Partitions are just take any set and carve it up in disjoint sets. Mm -hmm. Nothing joint. They all separate. And these can be ordered according to the size mm -hmm. so that the higher upper ones in the lattice have to can contain in their possibly larger blocks completely from the smaller one. So it's easily to, to order them. And the embedding theorem was simple. Show that any finite lattice I give you, you can find that as a sub-lattice in this partition mm -hmm. lattice. Namely, I can represent every lattice where the elements are partitions, and you combine them in an easy way. Well, it's a good <laughs> problem. Uh, it was clear to me that it was very, very tricky, and there was nothing kind of general the theory which I could apply. So I started reading lattice theory. A book I could find, it was a Berkhoff's book, nice thin volume, not a discouraging book. But then I looked at the problems at the end of the book, mm -hmm. research problems. And there was my partition 
embedding problem. I went to the old boss and said, this is a hard problem. It's in this book. Dilworth said, oh, don't worry. I was asked to review the book, and in my review, I solved several other problems. Mm. Well, that was not a very encouraging comment. There is Dilworth, well-known lattice theory researcher. Well-known, I mean. Mm -hmm. And he says, I solved some of these problems. Bright, brilliant, full professor. He solved some of the problems. But not that one. Not that one. But I thought, well, that may be really indicating his respect for my abilities. Well, there was nothing to be admired what I could do. I basically worked on it. I don't know. I wish I would have kept a log uh, how long. But I said, I got to look around that problem. And I said, you know, this no overlap whatsoever, that's maybe a little bit too harsh. What if I allow one overlap between the blocks, at, you know, at most mm -hmm. one? If the blocks overlap in two or three, they merge. They merge. And so I labeled it uh, generalized partition. And started working on it. And I proved some nice properties about it. And I said, well, what, what is it? What in mathematics behaves like this? One intersection is fine. More than one, you got to lump them together. I said, those are lines in a geometry. They either don't intersect, certainly not, they don't have the parallel, but when they intersect in more than one point, the lines are merged. And I said, by golly, these are lattices of geometries. And off I went, I'm going to solve this embedding problem. And I did. It mm -hmm. took some cleverness, but uh, when I told Dilworth, showed him the idea roughly what, how I have done it, uh, he said, write it up. And it basically meant you have a thesis. And I think this was probably in the third year at mm -hmm. Caltech, but I don't know exactly. I also wish I would know how long I've worked mm -hmm. on it. it. It took me some time, but, but I was just absolutely delighted. I had defined this problem because I couldn't solve the, the other one. And it turned out to be a nice object, mm -hmm. lattice of geometries. And there were now nice little results to prove that the 
the lattice, I think, of all geometries, I think was again a geometry. Mm -hmm. there, there were <laughs> things, you know, things that came out of there were ge geometries several times. And not, not only that, I de defined it myself, and it had, had an interesting solution. Well, it really, first time, gave me pleasure of having done it. Mm -hmm. And the real encouragement that, yes, I can do it now. In, I can, you know, I know how to do research. Yep. Well, Caltech concluded the same. <laughs> and so after four years at Caltech, I had a PhD, PhD. in mathematics. That's neat. It's a good, good, nice story. I think more of our PhD students have to hear stories like this. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, we it, if it encourages somebody to do research and he succeeds, yeah. more power to that result. So you finished your PhD and you came to Cornell. How did that happen? Well, like so many things, things just happened to me in life. Uh, Bob Walker, I think the chairman of the math department at Cornell, was looking for instructors. They had just mm -hmm. switched teaching calculus in a large class to many small classes, so they needed instructors. Yeah. Uh, the, the starting academic position for fresh PhDs were instructorships. So my friend Johnny Johnston at Caltech and myself got offers from Walker to come to Cornell and join the math department as instructors. Uh, Dilmore's advice, advice was, go east, young man. <laughs> he said to the elite east. Yeah. And he thought Cornell was just fine. Good. So we drove with my mother, to Ithaca, arrived, found that Ithaca was full. The students had rented <laughs> all their <laughs> places ahead of time. And we finally found a small apartment. Uh, well, I don't even rem <laughs> remember <laughs> what the street was. Uh, walking distance to Cornell, yeah. easy walking distance. Bell Sherman somewhere. It was it's one of the yes. apartment houses. You know, mm -hmm. there's a huge, big, this was when the man had built the first yeah. one, before he built the very large one. Mm -hmm. So very professional, nice apartment, but it was, Johnny and myself and my mother. <laughs> uh, you know, it was a lovely way. We had nice dinners prepared and uh, we were taken care of nicely. And uh, what did you spend, two years? I spent, two, yeah. I spent two years, but 
it just happened that a GE manager from their research laboratory who was given the job of building an information sciences research section. Mm -hmm. Well, very quickly it got translated to, to th that it's computer science. But it was information science originally. And uh, he has stopped by at Caltech, a name Shui, Dick Shui, Dictor, uh, Dr. Shui, and uh, said we need people for the information studies section. And <laughs> Bill Wars apparently said, I know the guy you need. <laughs> he is at Cornell. We showed up at Cornell mm -hmm. and said, I come from Pasadena and uh, you have been recommended to me for information studies section. Mm -hmm. This is GE in Schenectady. GE in Schenectady Research Lab on the bend of the Mohawk River. Uh -huh. uh, I said, sorry. I had agreed to go to Ohio State mm -hmm. to work on the lattice of groups mm -hmm. because Marshall Hall, the guy who invited me there, was at Cornell visiting okay. for a lecture. I told him about my thesis. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, mm -hmm. I am just thinking about lattices of geometries, <laughs> uh, groups, groups, sorry. And so I said to Shui, I can take a summer job, but that's all, because I have to be at Ohio State yeah. for at least a semester. He said, come, and gave me a at that time looked to me like a royal salary. Uh, and it was a beautiful group of people, just all hired and being hired, they're looking for people. Really excited about computing and particularly creating a computer science. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dick Stearns was there? No. Not yet. No, oh. not yet. Uh, I accepted for the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, read a lot, listened to lots of stuff about computer science, whatever mm -hmm. it was in those days. And uh, somebody, I read a paper about coding networks and wrote a paper that summer, which never occurred, sorry, never happened to me before that I enter a new field, write a paper in a, on a summer job. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, I was hooked. Computer science seemed to have all kinds of problems of which I knew I could work. And uh, G basically sure said if you want me to hire you now I will hire you now but I want you back when you finish your Ohio obligation 
Well, I went to Ohio State, huge university. Mm -hmm. I had an, some nice colleagues. Uh, and I went there as an assistant professor uh, where many of the people were still instructors. Mm -hmm. But our work with Marshall Hall didn't work. I was intellectually packing <laughs> to uh, return to the GE lab. And Marshall Hall had accepted a job at Caltech. <laughs> what a small world. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we talked, but I wrote up my thesis papers and, uh, you know, got them published, that publication then in journals mm -hmm. was slow. Yeah. The refereeing could last months and years, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And very often they asked you to rewrite things. Yeah. Uh, was different than submitting it to a journal. Sorry, submitting it to a conference. Uh, to a conference, yes, which is a publication, but uh, less prestigious, at least in uh, the traditional view. So you spent a, a year there at Ohio State? Nine months. Nine months. <laughs> Nine months. Got out as soon as you could? Yes. Back to GE. Went to GE. Uh, this time, there was Dick Stearns. No. Uh, I no, don't know exactly. Th he was either there or joined us next mm -hmm. summer. Uh, Stearns was doing uh, game theory at Princeton. Uh, was clearly a very, very gifted person and very laconic. He uh, didn't say anything when he didn't have to say something important. <laughs> uh, and so I returned to G Labs, and at that time, theoretical work in computer science was with switching circuits, finite state mm. machines, and things like that. And there was a, was a problem which uh, intrigued me, and that was when you want to build a finite automaton, You know what it's supposed to do, so you just see how much, how many states you need, on how the machine has to move around these states, and what it has to print. It gets inputs. But nobody said how what will the states be called? They must have a whatever lens, the minimal lens of codes you can assign to have it built. And so the move between the states didn't really tell you how to choose the names which determined 
how the circuits will look. And there were lots of nibbles at that problem. And I, I kind of thinking about my um, background said, well, maybe you don't have to really worry about the states for this big machine. Maybe you can build this machine from smaller ones, where the problem would be easier. So I quickly defined the partitions with substitution mm -hmm. property, basically just what the people did in, in uh, mathematics. Mm -hmm. And by golly, these machines did fall apart quite easily. And so I wrote a paper on the state assignment problem for sequential machines by saying, build it from smaller machines, and here is the mm -hmm. technology how to determine how they can be built, and really got enamored <laughs> by the machines. And clearly now, these lattices, sorry, the, the yeah. came out of the, the partitions which were preserved by mappings mm -hmm. of the machine, uh, a nice lattice, mm -hmm. you know, different partitions did different things. And it was accepted, and uh, people were delighted about it. And so I had my start. And then mm -hmm. Dick Stern showed up. I either was just finishing that paper, and with Dick, we had real fun because he was very, very quick, very smart, very silent. <laughs> uh, and we generalized not only the we, on what partition, what the machine how the machine transform it to another partition, mm -hmm. one operation. And we had defined a algebra of partition pairs and uh, got all kinds of results. For example, when you give me a machine, an automaton, just the state table, we had techniques to see how much feedback will have yeah. to be in the machine. Namely, there ha will have to be loops. Clearly, if there are no loops, there is a yes. definite way of building it. And we could ask questions like, what is the smallest, sorry, what is the biggest part which I can, so to say, break off which has no feedback. Yeah. So we could really do structure of these things. And, you know, we could give you techniques, biggest front part, no feedback, <laughs> and then biggest <laughs> tail part, no feedback. All the feedback is in the middle, <laughs> you know. So and so it looked very interesting. He wrote a book. <laughs> Just <laughs> and you know, we were full-time researchers, so we had no other obligations but to kind of spread a good spirit in the company about computing. You know, it's something different in those days. 
as opposed to today. You don't find these research labs where people are free to do whatever they want for years and years. You always have to do something to get a product out or so on. Their labs used to be that way. The transistor was developed in the same kind of fashion. Yes. And the language C in Unix came out of Bell Labs simply because these people were free to do whatever they want and they wanted to build an operating system. Yes. It's different today. In my well, mind. yeah. But the people who really were allowed to do whatever they yeah. wanted uh, had somehow already proven their yes. yeah. originality, yep. their ability. Mm -hmm. And there were not very many. No. I mean, mm. there were many at the GE Research Lab who worked on artificial diamonds. Hmm. And GE made billions, particularly in small ones, for grinding yeah. and so on. Uh, yes. So you and Dick worked for two, three years? No, no. Two years? Uh, I was there, I guess, seven years. Seven years. Ah, okay. This was some time. Uh, and I have to recompute yes. and rethink yes. when I went there, and and I can make mistakes yes. on that. Sure. Uh, but it was a substantial time. Yes. Yes. And and, uh, and, and Dick stayed after I left. I see. For Cornell. And that's where you did the work that got you the Turing Award. Yes. Uh, so, on the algebraic structure mm -hmm. of sequential machines mm -hmm. was our book yeah. uh, published. Uh, several editions were out, but All of the theoretical work in computer science really moved to bigger things, mm -hmm. push down automata. Mm -hmm. Turing machines sat there, and people knew it was an awful thing because it was so complicated yes. to, to write. Actually write programs. Uh, programs. And When Dick and Stearns really we knew about Turing machines, but we had never viewed it really as a real model for computing. Hmm. We, we knew it was, I mean, because you could prove there are universal yeah. Turing machines and on and on. But we started asking questions which were quantitative. Uh, how much better is a many tape machine than a one tape machine? How much faster can the many tape machine compute problems? You know, People hadn't asked those questions. Mm -hmm. And what we really were after, if we modify a Turing machine, how much does the computation time on the Turing machine change? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what if the question give you many tapes was easily solved in the square of the time mm. of the one tape machine. Whatever it took. Uh, we were delighted when we discovered that you could uh, have a two-dimensional tape 
and you lost only a square huh. in the computation time. Uh, and so on. And we, we found that whatever we, however we modified the machine is what we yeah. wanted for ease of programming and things like that. Uh, we could put a quantitative thing, and most of them are really squares and things yeah. like that. So we realized that it was a good so model. It's a good but model for studying computation, not for actual programming. There's a difference between having a language in which oh. you can program and one where you don't really want to write lots of oh, programs. Yeah, you, the structure is so simple that you can study it. Yes, exactly. But by then, compilers were yeah. already being constructed. And we knew that you can, whatever language you have, you could build a compiler to compile down to a Turing machine. You know, yeah. a horrible compiler. Yes. But, no, no, that's what scared people away. And we just said, you never think about doing it in the Turing machine. You know you can compile down from any language. And that if you do tinker with a machine, we can quantize yeah. how much damage you have done. And then, you know, we said, fine, now we define complexity classes. And there we hit on the right thing. Very, without thinking much, that the difficulty of the computation should be in terms of the length of the input, not the particular input, as they do in recursive function theory. Mm -hmm. It's always x. Yeah. Uh, Complexity classes were just defined how fast a function has to grow in the length of the input. And, uh, you know, that was it. Manuel Blum was doing, in some sense, a parallel development of axiomatic hmm. uh, complexity theory. Very simple couple of axioms. If they satisfied, that was a measure given by somebody. And they could prove all kinds of things. They proved some very strange things, uh, surprising things. And, you know. We had one such result uh, after, just after I stopped being at uh, GE, when I went to Cornell, my first student in computer science uh, proved called Borodin proved the gap theorem. And we had hierarchy theorems. Hierarchy theorem said slight increase in the computation time gives you things which you cannot do in the lower bound. It's a gross. So computation times which can be done in time n to 2.001. 
there are functions which you can co co compute in that time, but not in n square. Yeah. You know, so just that the two bounds basically have to go to zero. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of technicality that a log factor shows up <coughs> simply because you have to also not only diagonalize over a set, you have to compute while you're mm -hmm. doing that the bound in which you have to do it. So they had to, a clock had to be running, which is no more. Mm -hmm. And originally that was a squaring the time. Stearns and Henny showed that you can do many tape, uh, many tapes on one tape, basically by losing the, the log vector, log n in this case. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that, that must have been an exciting time, so why did you leave and come to Cornell? Well, I had always had the dream, the expectation that it's a tenure, mm -hmm. such a wonderful thing, you know. <laughs> clearly, uh, in our original understanding, much more powerful than it really is. And uh, but permanent position in those days, it was probably to age sixty-five. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and there was an idea that academic jobs are good. And uh, Bob Walker, the guy who hired me for the Cornell Mass Department, called up and said, Yours, we are starting a computer science department. We have a million dollars research support for it. So you won't have to worry about money for a while. Uh, everybody is enthusiastic about the department. I said, the mathematicians? He said, some, yes, <laughs> definitely. They will uh, join if you ask. And uh, Walker himself would join the department until we find <coughs> younger replacements for him. Anyway, so he said, why don't you come out? Ellie and I, we drove out to Cornell. It looked so ideal, <laughs> I mean, so clean. Uh, Compared to Schenectady. Well, Schenectady was different yeah. because you do have awareness that you really have to do excellent work if you want to be independent. You really yeah. have to. And, uh, you know, you're still working for a profit organization mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, I accepted. Tenured professor, they couldn't give you tenure like that. Right. But so they said it's a the tenure. Promise of tenure. It's a yes. tenured offer. Mm -hmm so and so and money was discussed later, sorry, after other discussions, money was settled. Uh, sorry, so 
funding, mathematics, electrical engineering are in favor of starting it. Operations research also. Operations research would give Dick Conway mm -hmm. to us. Dick Conway turned out to be very important when I tried, when I started building the department, when I accepted and came to Cornell. Conway did things which I needed encouragement and support. Like the course load? Like the course load. I was amazed that nobody informed me what the course load at Cornell is. <laughs> And I didn't ask. I knew what it was in mathematics and uh, in some humanities. But I decided that one course a semester plus participate in a seminar, mm -hmm. which meant you can either run a seminar or participate in somebody else's seminar. And uh, we could pay better salaries than what was the going rate for computer science assistant professors. And, you know, I didn't know it could be done, but. Uh, When I was asked, you know, what would it take to get somebody, mm -hmm. I said to the dean, uh, such and such salary, fine. <laughs> uh, tenure. So, no, associate okay. professorship. No tenure. Okay. Yes. So I came here as on a five year professor, assistant yes. professor. They had the title. Yep. And th that's why how Hopcroft was hired. Me and Dennis. John Dennis also came as associate without tenure, I believe. Yeah, but was he not a little bit older already? No, he was my age. Okay. Uh, no, but I mean academically. Out, yeah. Academically, yeah. Not about the same. Okay. Close. Yes. Very innovative. So you you came here to start the department. I think the provost had a different idea of what the department should be. No, no. Than you did. The dean. The dean. Sorry, sir, sorry. Uh, uh, vice president uh, for vice research. Vice president, yes. Was basically in some sense, un under the vice president of research, mm -hmm. that he had rights to, to say, because he was administrating mm -hmm. the Sloan Foundation grant yeah. of the money which was paying. I mean, those were under the vice president. Yeah. And very early, I detected that he did not want the department to grow fast. And my idea was grow as fast as you can. Well, you have the money, the initial publicity and all that. And uh, first or second year, basically engineering took over our budget. Mm -hmm. Dean Schultz yes. was basically the man I dealt with. And he was decisive and good. He was also a friend of Dick Conway, came from the same area. Yes, same department. Yes. Yeah. So you, you did a great job, in my mind, of s getting 
good people here for the department the first five, six, eight, ten years? Well, as you know, I take great pride that three of them, you, Hopcroft, Constable, are still here. Yeah, still here. And, and, you know, have yeah. contributed tremendously to the growth and the intellectual environment yes. of the department and so on. And the other thing about the department is that it's always been congenial. Very rarely have we had political fights. You did a great job of setting it up so that everybody respected everybody, and it continues to this day. Uh, and I hope, yes. I sincerely hope, it continues forever. Yes. yes. Uh, we are by now big. You just have to uh, attend the, yeah. the luncheon, yes. the faculty luncheon, to realize that uh, there are long discussions about hiring, yes. who should and should not be considered, and so on. So uh, let's talk about research. I find it interesting that OR did not seem to get involved in complexity issues, did they? I mean, they had the traveling salesman problem, but they never looked at complexity issues. They are in it now a lot. Yes. In fact, ORIE is no longer operations research and industrial uh. engineering. It's operations research and information engineering. Yeah. Yes. So did you talk no. to OR people at all or much? Well, like Dick Conrad yeah, yeah, he, he was certainly, yeah. a full professor of OR. Yeah. And uh, as I said before, and it's certainly worth repeating, I was surprised how little direction I got mm -hmm. what to do with the department. And that gave me a chance with Conway sitting there. Pushing you off. And just saying, do it. Do it. <laughs> do it. Uh, you know, I was quite so shocked when Conway walked in one day and said, uh, yours you got to write an annual report. <laughs> what? <laughs> he said, okay, okay, I'll give you an annual report from another department. Anyway, uh, you know, things like that up kept popping up and Conway was good, he knew. And he also knew that very often minimal responses to the, not orders, but mm. the regulations, whatever, traditions, uh, were quite acceptable. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, uh, he was very influential. Yes. Um, one of the important problems is still open. That's P equal NP. Yes. Have you tried to solve it? Oh, or yes. Your, your students? Yes. I, I know NP. it's a very, it's amazingly hard problem but we don't understand why. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking about such things, just the last year when I was at GE, when we did complexity mm -hmm. theory, and very excited about the time mm -hmm. computations and so on, Phil Lewis, 
was needling us about doing tape complexity, memory mm -hmm. amount in computations. How, how fast does the memory have to grow? And that we explored quickly and had our great surprises. One, the PNNP problem basically ask what does non-determinism mm -hmm. buy you in computation? And it's the open problem for sure. And it's practically important. Well, we know shortly after and now it flows in that I'm at Cornell, and so mm -hmm. students start working for me. And I will not try to differentiate exactly <laughs> where what was no, done. That's tough to do. But Immerman showed that non-deterministic tape computations are closed under complement. So when you take the complement, it can again be done by non-deterministic non uh, tape-bounded computations. Uh, now that's exactly different than what's happening in PNNP. Mm -hmm. because clearly the complement of an NP problem, we certainly don't believe is again NP. Yeah. So for tape, we know something which is completely different than for time. And for tape now, there is a much stronger, there is a actually a stronger result uh, by Savage. Savage showed, sorry, we showed, Stearns and I, that Non-determinist, you have S size, uh, non-deterministic tape computations. Then you know that you have S square tape bound uh, deterministic tape yeah. computations. So there. Non-determinism doesn't buy you much, yes. which is quite different than mm -hmm. we believe is the case with PNP, time comes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were other things which tape was, was very interesting, amusing. Uh, the one is that we asked ourselves, what happens at very, very small tape bounds? Well, how can you have very small tape bounds? The input is length n. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we said, that's input tape. You can't work on it. Right. You will get another tape, which <laughs> we put <laughs> below the machine, which is a working tape. Mm -hmm. And the complexity is measured on how much extra of tape, that yeah. tape you use. And uh, we very quickly proved that you can go down to log log yeah. tape computations. So you can't even count to the length of the input, yeah. which you cannot log tape. 
So log tape had been used, you know, s somewhere. But, and we said, what's down there? And one thing was, we discovered context-free languages yeah. down there, ah. which are not regular. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So context-free languages, which are accepted by push-down stacks, mm -hmm. and push-down stacks are good for counting, yep. comparing lengths, mm -hmm. but you can only have log-log well, log lengths. do it in just that. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Neat. And not only that, You know, you can also think about the nature of numbers. Let's think that we j will just look at finite or infinite mm -hmm. strings of decimal or binary, it doesn't matter. Uh, what? And now measure Lost my thought. You're, you're looking at oh, numbers, oh, digits, oh. integers. Well, no. Yeah. The interesting ones yeah. clearly are the the algebraic yeah. numbers, the yeah. um, solutions of polynomials mm -hmm. and so on. They're all. In n square, hmm. sorry, yeah, well, in mm -hmm. the square of the lens, but we don't know whether, if, if you define numbers to be real time computable, that hmm. you can print the sequence of digits out yeah. in a fixed yeah. intervals, or best of all. Hmm. Uh, one after the other. Uh, so that's real time. And there are real time transcendental numbers we know. <laughs> but we don't know where square root sits. Huh. You know, these mm -hmm. digits. Uh, we, we know how to compute them. But you don't know how fast. But it or how much tape. the time it keeps increasing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we, s we have a conjecture which said if something is real time computable, then it got to be either periodic mm -hmm. eventually, I mean, yeah. rational number. Or uh, transcendental. No, that's an amazing conjecture, mm -hmm. which one computer scientist labeled the true Hartmannus conjecture, <laughs> or something like that, mm -hmm. in in a techni technical uh, report. Yeah. Anyway, so. All kinds of very interesting questions are still wi yes. wide open. So you really started something way back in 58, 62, 64, about uh, the yes. whole field. And I think the, the not only CS, but the whole world owes you a lot of um, thanks and honor for doing this. It's been a tremendous career. And I'm happy to have known you and have been able to sit here and talk with you. Um, well, David, it's been a hmm? pleasure to have hired you <laughs> and a pleasure to have had you as yes. a colleague and friend. Uh, and yes, uh, It's been a great experience. Yes.
exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it still is, although I don't understand most of what's happening these days. Well, like the machine learning, and deep learning, and all these things. All sorts of things happening. In well, uh, yeah. Yes. And so let's hope this department keeps going stronger and stronger. I, I sincerely hope so. Part of my enjoyment has now come from watching it yes. grow. And I think there are some very, very good people. Yes. Yep. Among the young offers, and yeah. clearly, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, on so that. Thank you that very note, much. That note, we're quit. It's been wonderful. Thanks. And let's. We have many more years together. Good. Good.